Okay, let's keep things going here. Robert Swan, polar explorer and environmental leader. He's the first man ever to walk unsupported to both the North and South Poles. To put that into perspective, the Landmark Ventures office is at 32nd and Park in New York, and I get super grouchy when I have to walk down to 14th Street. His contribution to education and the environment have been recognized through his appointment as UN Goodwill Ambassador for Youth, a visiting professorship of the School of Environment at Leeds University, and in 1994, he became Special Envoy to the Director General of UNESCO. He is quoted as saying, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Please welcome Robert Swan. Wonderful, thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to close this afternoon. And I just want to thank Zeeve. I don't know where you are, but thank you very much for always remembering us, all of us. Good man. I'm going to talk very quickly about response to challenge. Response to challenge. And a lot of people, as I am, the first person in history stupid enough to have walked to both bloody poles. If you are that person, people often say to you, why are you still alive? Well, I think probably the most important reason I'm still alive is that before we undertake missions, most people say to me two very clear things. First, Rob, you're going to fail. Secondly, Rob, you're going to die. And as Arian was just saying, you know, a lot of people want you to fail. And I think it's terribly important that, uh, especially in our business, that you're the positive person around the table. It's very easy to be negative in a world addicted to negative. Now, where did this all begin for me? It began at the age of 11, last time I had a decent haircut, and uh, it had a lot to do with a dream. Don't forget our dreams. And to put that dream into reality, it took seven years to raise five million US dollars on my own, a lot of money then, a hell of a lot of money now, and eventually three of us laid out our equipment on the edge of Antarctica, and we undertook the longest unassisted march ever made anywhere on Earth in history. And again, to echo it, everybody said we were going to die. We just said we were going to get thin. And thin we did get. I lost 69 pounds in 70 days. And as we pulled our sledges 900 nautical miles to one building, the kind of size of the lobby out there, the South Pole Scientific Station, we had to cross uh, 6,000 crevasses. And if you fall into a crevasse, you don't come home. So we really had to learn trust. It's a word we should not lose in this world. And in this photograph, we're standing in an area the size of the United States of America. And we're the only people there. Think of that. And beneath our feet, 16,000 feet of solid ice, 90% of all the world's Ice is there, we're standing on it. 70% of all the world's fresh water, it's there, and mark my words, please. If we continue to melt this, we swim. And after 70 very hard days, we arrived at the South Pole, we had five minutes to celebrate, and then we were told, sorry lads, your ship just sank. Our ship which came back to collect us. And on this day, I realized quite a lot of things, really. A, the chances of winning the lottery are very, very positive in my favor after this. But secondly, that leadership, in my humble opinion, is about thinking carefully before you make a commitment. And once you make it, do it. And we'd promised our patron, the great Jacques Cousteau, that we would take away our base camp. And it would take an extra year of our lives, living in Antarctica, and eventually we left Antarctica as we found it. Deliver on what you say you're going to do. Something happened to me walking to the South Pole that brought me here. My eyes changed colour in 70 days through damage. Our faces blistered out. We didn't know why, and when we got home, we were told by NASA, guess what? We walked under the hole in the ozone layer the month it was discovered. Fabulous. Fabulous. Ultraviolet rays down, hit the ice, bounced back, 
fried out our eyes, burnt off our faces. Now, this started me thinking that maybe, maybe our survival here on earth is not somebody else's problem. Maybe I should have a part to play in it, albeit small. First, we had to do a bit more walking to the North Pole, yes. 700 miles on foot, every step away from the safety of land. So our destination is 700 miles from safety. Beneath our feet, five miles of ocean. This would be our home, eight of us from seven different nations. Here's me coming in from washing, yes, translated into American at a temperature of minus 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Naked. Gentlemen. <laughs> you will notice, gentlemen, that there is absolutely nothing hanging down in the central area. It's your job to explain to our esteemed ladies later why and how this happens <laughs> to a naked man at below minus 70. Let's just say it's a bit cold. We are now 641 miles from land. And the only thing we hadn't planned for happens. The entire ocean melts beneath our feet four months before it ever had. And do remember, we're not, we're British, so no one knows where we are. We don't have a radio, we don't have a CNN camera crew filming us from the sky. We don't have a Russian submarine there just in case we might get our feet wet. No one knows where we are, and we're dead. Because the ice cap's moving towards us faster than we can move forward. And on this day, I realized what I would have to be, that I wasn't an explorer. I wasn't an environmentalist. I wasn't a scientist. I was too stupid. But what I was was a survivor. And a survivor does not see a perceived threat and do nothing about us. Climate change is happening. How much we're causing it still seems to be in debate, but it is happening, and we need to respond to that challenge. It was a fight to come through this, but after exactly 56 days, we reached the North Pole, job done, flew a flag, I think still is important, got back home, thought I could go and see Mum, summoned by Jacques Cousteau and given a 50-year mission. Fabulous. No budget. I was just told, Rob, go out, save Antarctica. The treaty that protects it, that means that as we sit here, all of us own Antarctica. No one owns it. We do. And Jacques Cousteau gave me that mission 25 years ago. We have 25 years to go. To begin with, I realized two clear missions to have the sense to leave one place alone on Earth forever. First, engage young people, because they'll be voting in 2041. And secondly, get going on clean, renewable energy. Because if we use more clean, renewable energy here, save energy, God bless America, perhaps use some different types of energy that are clean, we won't have to go to Antarctica to exploit it. Two missions, young people, renewable energy, that became the job. I took down a team of young people. We found 1,500 tonnes of twisted le metal left in Antarctica. This took eight years, uh, $10.2 million. The idiot here had to raise. I wish I'd saved some. Um, but this was a fantastic mission, a practical mission to inspire young people. Uh, we loaded the ship. That took four months. And as we loaded the ship, the words of my wonderful mum, who was 101 last week, fab. Um, <laughs> mum, mum was all about recycling before it was on some box. And she said, as though she, only she could, Robert, you can't possibly go to the Antarctic. Remove all that rubbish and not recycle it, boy. I said, mum, we're on it. So I'm very proud to say that uh, we recycled all of this 3,000 miles back in Uruguay, South America. People are not inspired by words, I think. They're inspired by action. And a lot of young people look at this and think, well, I best move the arm and recycle that bottle or can, because otherwise Rob will be on my case. And on this day, the penguins came ashore onto their clean beach 
the job was done. Very proud of that. As we sailed north on our ship full of garbage, the Larsen B ice shelf told us something. It broke off. We should listen. We have, on our renewable energy mission, built education stations all over the world. One in Antarctica. This is my home there. Check out the plastic flowers, girls. Efforts are made. But this place <laughs> runs only on renewable energy. And if we can do it there, we can do it more here. It works. Uh, India, my favorite place on the planet. And I think I would like you to think of one really important word that is quite hard. And that word is relevant. It's really important for all of us to just check that we're still being relevant. It's very easy to think you're being relevant and then find out you're not. And I try my best to have a relevancy check now and again. So I went to India, 1.4 billion people, who if they want all of this, which they have every right to want, and make the same, make, same mistakes getting all of this as we still make, we swim. We're completely irrelevant to that. So we must engage with places like India. And I tried, and it was really painful. I spent the last four years in India, just moved to California, a bit of a shock. Um, four years on a bicycle going around India, visiting young people, going to schools, colleges, and universities. They wouldn't remember me if I came in a white suit and was frightfully British and said, I think we really ought to move this. But they won't forget the fat old guy on his bike looking a bit red in the face. Be relevant. And in India, we built education stations. Uh, we've been up to the Himalayas, where, which in fact is melting, ladies and gentlemen, only provides 3.2 billion people with water, and it's melting. So in a small way, we've tried, built an education station high up in the Himalayas, and only last month, we went to a monastery and gave the monastery electric light for the first time ever through solar. And this guy could see what he was doing for the first time in 2,000 years. Good stuff. And this young man was had the first electric light after 6 o'clock at night, but from solar. It might not mean that much, but in my humble opinion, we need to step it up. We need to try more. We have an education station uh, in, the, in West Virginia, which is on top of a mountain. Well, it's not anymore. It was taken away for coal, and a lot of young people go there every year. We go down to Antarctica, and we're going again in March. Anybody fancy a quick trip, do come with us. A lot of young people from India, a lot of young people from China, and a lot of girls, fantastic women from the Middle East. I'm so proud of them. Um, you know, we don't join the dots sometimes about the Middle East. There's 150 million young people unemployed there. So to inspire them, we've taken a lot of young people from the Middle East, we see where the ice caps are melting. People who say that climate change isn't happening really ought to go to Antarctica with us, experience the hottest day in history in the Antarctic, which we did this March. But the good news is, and I just want to check this quickly, how many people here know there's a hole in the ozone layer? How many people here honestly know that it's fixing itself? Honestly? Very few of you. Why don't you know it? Because it's good news. That's why. How many people here have ever heard of Sir Robert Swan? Not many of you. Why? Because it's a great good news story. The point is that we need to be in the good news business to inspire people. NASA announced on July the 4th this year that because we got our act together 27 years ago, the hole in the ozone is fixing itself. Now, we'd spent 25 years trying to protect Antarctica as a natural reserve land for science and peace. I'm hauled in by NASA and told, Rob, big areas of Antarctica are now starting to break off, which we didn't anticipate. What's happening in Antarctica is huge ice shelves that they didn't think were disintegrating are now disintegrating. What this does is to allow huge, bigger areas 
of Antarctica to come off into the ocean, and it's a lot of ice, ladies and gentlemen, a huge amount of ice. This is survival stuff. So, you know, if we don't, we swim in New York, we swim in Shanghai, and these poor people in the Maldives are already swimming, and they didn't do anything to deserve it. So, unfortunately, remember I said relevance. Well, I think it requires a little bit more walking. And uh, at the end of next year, we're going back to the South Pole, 30 years ago, we did the blue line. Now we're doing the green line, and we're going to do it only on renewable energy. I guarantee you, and my son, Barney, where are you? My son, Barney, volunteered to come and walk with his father. Um, look after me, in fact. And we're going to do 600 miles at the end of next year, only on renewable energy. Uh, and we're off uh, next week down to Antarctica to test out with NASA all of this equipment before we go at the end of next year, uh, 600 miles to the pole. Now, finally, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's quite important just to say this, that, you know, I'm an Englishman. I live now in California because we're working with NASA. And I just want to say that, you know, we have to look at things in a positive way. There is a new president of this country. We need to work with that. We can't just sit back and say, ooh, isn't it terrible? And I intend, actually, to go and visit him and talk about the Antarctic. I think that's really important. We have a fantastic story that you've just heard, but I am totally useless at getting that message out. It's sad but true. So if anybody here might be able to help us get that message out to inspire young people around the world, I'd be very grateful indeed. So good luck to you all, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you.